Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, my background is astrophysics, but I'm very glad to have been invited here. And uh, some of the, or most, well, a lot of these critters I've um, looked into with my colleague Brenda and Raymond. And um, what I came up to speed on was the information theory aspects. And I usually don't just read from a slide, that's kind of boring, but in this case I will. These are just some important points when you get into the land of information theory. It only measures meaning. Uh, when Weaver wrote up what Shannon had discovered, he said, it's not what you are saying, but what you could say. So information theory can say, will humpback ever be translated, say Shakespeare ever be translated into humpback? That's something information theory could theoretically answer, not what are humpback whales saying. Communication complexity, as I mentioned earlier, only applies to the rule structure as we use it in our uh, definition, not to the data set itself. Okay, so you get this very complex data, say a whole bunch of Marines on the uh, parade route, on the parade track, and you say, attention, you've applied a rule, and the rule means you get 10 rows of 100 men. Now you have, a less, uh, you have less information, technically, less information entropy, but you have more rule structure. So if you're referring to complexity, we like to refer to the rule structure, okay? So after attention, you have more rule structure. Meaning, I'll discuss also, maybe <clears throat> with the information theoretic terms ambiguity and equivocation, you might be able to ascertain meaning if you know the purpose of the communication. So if you can try and ascertain what the purpose of the communication is, you can use information theory from both sides of a two-way communication channel. And I applied this to um, a communication from a cotton plant to a wasp, or cotton plants to wasps, just to show that you could use information theory to quantify the um, communication between the plant and animal kingdom, because this is as close to SETI as we're going to get so far. Uh, this may be helpful. Information entropy, we'll just call entropy. Before it's measured, let's call it uncertainty. After it's measured, let's call it information. So I say, um, I want you to guess uh, a word. What's the last letter? Well, your least uncertain answer is E. Your most uncertain answer for the word to begin with the letter is Q. So if you guess E, and I say, you're right. Well, you haven't learned a whole lot, have you? So less risk at, fr at first, less information. If you guess Q, that's a really uncertain guess, but if I say yes, the word starts with Q, you've got a lot of information. You're almost going to guess the word next. Now, it's the opposite meaning of making an informed decision. You say, I want to make an informed decision. You want more constraints on what your choices are. That's the opposite of the definition mathematically. Okay? So don't get confused. Making an informed decision is more constraints but the higher information entropy is the less constraints, the number of choices you have. And finally, thermodynamic entropy is the number of possible states of gases and molecules and stuff. <coughs> information is the number of possible choices. But you have to be careful because interacting with thermodynamics increases the entropy, whereas interacting with information decreases the entropy. It's called the theory of the noisy channel. So they act in opposite directions. So if you're not thoroughly confused right now, we'll continue to talk. <coughs> OK, now I have a computer, and I say, I want you to learn English and print out stuff that I can understand. So I'm going to give you the English alphabet. Here you go. Tell me what you know. And this is what the computer knows. It basically prints out the alphabet. That's a zero-order entropy. It's log base 2 because you want it in units of bits. So. Log base 2 just means if you have a switch, you get two choices. If you have two switches, you get four choices. If you have three switches, you get eight possible. So putting things in bits is all this is doing. The zero-order entropy is basically your repertoire size. And this is what you get from a computer. Now, you have to make sure your signals are correctly classified. <coughs> We're going to move right past that. <coughs> That's another talk or something. Now, the first order entropy, if you have a sufficient sampling so that you know that your 
frequencies of occurrence can be represented by the probability, then this is the probability of signal I, and this is the information in the probability of signal I. Those together make the information entropy. Are we cruising along here? <clears throat> now you have to make sure it's ergodic. The word ergodic in this case stands for make sure your sample doesn't undergo a discontinuity. If you're trying to make English and you get to 4.5 uh, letter length, you're making a transition into words. So you change from units of letters to units of words. So it's not an ergodic sample. Just make sure your sample statistics are staying the same as you add stuff. <clears throat> now, first order approximation to English, space takes up about 18%, E takes 10%, and T takes you know, 9%, and down to Q and Z and all take 0.1%. So you've given weights, uh, frequencies of occurrence, and that's where you get the probabilities. So basically, you give that to a computer. This is the second rule you've given it. <clears throat> the computer says, look, here's what I get. This is English. Well, you don't have much, but you do have the word size and the vowels to consonants ratios. So you do have something that's now approaching English. Now, the units of this first order entropy, if you use log base 10 and you do a plot against rank in order, then what you get is called Ziff's Law. Ziff's Law is a linguistic law that uh, George Ziff found he had his students count the number of E's in Ulysses, bless their hearts, before word processors. And they plotted the, uh, the number uh, frequency of occurrence, log of the frequency of occurrence, against rank, basically against the log of 1, log of 2, log of 3, log of 4. And they got this minus 1 slope, and Raymond is going to talk about that. <clears throat> uh, it's a neat way to do a quick look to see if you might have complexity. Okay, now let's continue and, and let's use what's called the diagram structure. And we now given the computer another rule. We said here's the frequency of occurrence of different, uh, we'll use English letters again. And how often does, for example, TH occur? Well, a lot. QU and so on. And you can see that if I say I'm thinking of a letter, you'd probably guess E. I'm going, okay, well, wait a second. This is the second letter. The first letter is a T. Then you'll probably guess H. Well, you wouldn't ordinarily guess H, except you are taking into account the conditional probability that H follows T a lot. So you can see conditional probability is introduced at the second order entropic level. And what you would say is this is the, uh, you know, the influence that the previous, what happened previously has affected. So at this time, the computer would print out this. And notice there are some real English words and all you've done is introduce the diagram or, or second order entropy. So, <clears throat> I'm going to discuss this in a little more detail, but uh, let's keep going. Here's the third order entropy and the trigram structure. And you put that in a computer and it will print out this. So now you're actually kind of semi approaching some real English. And what's interesting is. Because, the, like I said, the average English word is four and a half uh, <coughs> letters long, we encounter a discontinuity. Now, what if you put in all the English rules, grammar and everything else, then you should be able to get real um, you know, sentences and so on. Now, Brenda's going to go into this in a little more detail, but we call this the autocorrelation approach, because what do you do with animals? You have a whole bunch of data, and now you want to back out the rules. So you take into account these kind of equations, and you try and back out what the rule structure is. And that is our rigorous mathematical definition of complexity, the one we use. So it basically means the number and complexity of rule structure. But as you can see, you have to have a whole bunch of data to back out the rules that are involved in, for example, humpback or, or a bottlenose dolphin. <clears throat> okay, we call this the autocorrelation approach, and anybody wants to correct me on the, another use of a term, that's basically because it's looking at a whole data set and seeing the internal complexity that's there. So you collect a whole bunch of dolphin whistles or whatever like that, and you back out the rule structure. And that, mostly they've done that in Russia. 
uh, this is a good reference I can send to you, Yaglam and Yaglam. And as less familiar for people using information theory in the United States, cross-correlation, and this is a good reference too, is more the approach. Now you say, okay, well, autocorrelation, you're determining the complexity within a communication system. What about, auto, about cross-correlation? Well, cross-correlation, you're looking at two different data sets and comparing them with each other. For example, one data set is, here's what I transmitted. Another data set is, here's what I received. Now, if there's a noiseless channel, they're equal. But if there's noise in the way, you will actually set up correlations, and you have to compute two more things. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about that later. OK, we're almost done with definitions. You have two communications, X and Y, and these are the elements of the communication, and they're all correctly categorized and stuff. And the probability, the conditional probabilities involved in data set one and data set two are, this is basically that if I equals, if X equals I this time around, and Y equals J, this is, in other words, J occurs after X. So in other words, H is more likely after T is the first word, or the first letter. So, and this is this other thing. This is the, if, if Y has occurred, how does that influence X? So this is basically the, the mathematics. And this is what the joint entropy is. It can be represented this way, where you have the probability that I will occur, and then the probability that J will occur having had I in front of it, plus the opposite, plus vice versa. Now, the joint entropy, things occurring together, will only be equal to the, the two probabilities multiplied by each other if they are independent. And what that means is, if you roll a dice and you wait a minute and then you roll the dice again, they're not correlated with each other. The second roll of the dice doesn't care about the first roll. If that's the case, that's then the joint entropy will equal just the probabilities. Now what you can do is you can roll the dice and then roll the dice again and keep doing that and collecting joint entropies and then compare them with the probability if there's any conditional probability between the rolls of the dice. If there is, you don't have a fair die. And that's how you can find it. Uh, where are you looking? This one, yeah. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. The plus sign should be equal? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, thank you. That should be an equal, guys. Okay, thanks for catching that. Nothing like flying in and working on equations. Yeah. Oh, could be. Yeah, sure. There are things like, see, that's what's interesting is the noise in the noisy channel can be anything. It can be cultural. <clears throat> You're going, well, I heard you say that in Japanese very clearly, but I'm really confused. That's cultural noise. If you can characterize the noise, you're uh, way ahead of the game. We usually assume white Gaussian. Okay, <clears throat> so the joint entropy is what we usually measure because everything's happening at once. X and Y happen at the same time simultaneously. You don't get to wait and roll the dice. The critter is vocalizing or whatever, and they're all vocalizing together, and it's very confused. So you usually just can measure this. And from that, though, you can see how much shared information there is between uh, the previous vocalization and the next one. So here's how you calculate the overlapping information. You, the information in the first message plus the information in the second message minus the joint information. If that's zero, then there's no overlapping information. Okay, we're almost done. <clears throat> we also have something called the ambiguity, which is uh, conditional probabilities in the transmitted signal. So if you're kind of ambiguous about your transmission, then you're introducing non-clarity, okay? 
It's how sure are you that that's what was transmitted. And then the equivocation is how sure are you that what you received was what was transmitted. So these are uncertainties based on defin mathematical definitions of conditional probabilities. Yes, exactly what they are. Yeah, sender and receiver noise. Um, yeah, you can think of it that way. How am I doing on time? Uh oh, already? Okay, I'll, I'll finish up in like three minutes. Okay, I'm going to talk about all these things. <laughs> now, I'll just uh, <laughs> mention. Um, uh, basically, there were cotton plants that were putting out certain chemical signals, and if they had a worm on them, uh, they sent a chemical signal that appealed to birds, these nine signals. And if they had a caterpillar, we'll say, then they sent one that appealed to these wasps. And they let the wasps go, and they landed on the cotton plants that had the caterpillars that they like. So it's a one-way communication channel from the plant to the animal kingdom. And the cotton plant was transmitting 2.4 bits. Well, to choose between two kinds of plants, which two kinds of predators, the wasp only needed one bit of information. So why is the cotton plant using 2.4 bits? Also, well, the fact is the cotton plant has more predators, and I knew that just from looking at the cotton plant. And the cotton plant basically told me 2.4 bits are five vocabulary, 5.3. So the cotton plant had to have had more predators. And the success of the wasp indicates that this is a new communication system because it's still only 73% efficient. Oh, humpback whales. Uh, maybe we'll skip that. They make bubble nets and things. Uh, let me just point out that uh, you can treat uh, information theories developed at Bell Labs. And the basic idea was to uh, figure out how much wire they had to string. So they calculated how much static noise was on the line. Well, what you can do is you can say Glacier Bay, Alaska is a, a telephone line, and this is the static, which is boat noise. And now you know how much the boats are narrowing the channel capacity. So then what we did is we looked at humpback whales and how much they were slowing down their data rate. And they only slowed it down. This is, this is um, a technique. It isn't, it was, um, the data was collected kind of arbitrarily. So, But as a technique, you can look at the channel capacity and how much it decreased. And it decreased, say, that much. And the humpback whales only stopped their vocalizing by about 60%. So you're saying, well, don't the humpback whales have survival value in, in correcting completely? In other words, how did they, why did they stop halfway when there's still boat noise? And the answer is that they had rule structure. Like when you, when you uh, have a, a, a paper, a copy, and it's low on toner, you don't go back to do another Xerox if you, don't, if you can fill in the missing letters and words. So that's what the humpbacks kind of do the same sort of thing. They have enough rule structure so that they don't have to go back and hear the whole message. They only have to correct 60%. That's what kind of the indication of things you can do. And finally, while bees, I just say you can use polar coordinates. Well, we'll talk about bees later if you have questions. Um, this is the calculation you use to calculate the amount of information. If you think, like E.O. Wilson, for example, had studied ants, and as the ants came together, one ant went off and within a certain Gaussian distribution found the, the food source. So you're saying, okay, now I know the purpose of the communication was for this ant to tell that ant to go to the food. This is the amount of information that the first ant would have had to transmit to the second ant in order to do this sigma well. Does that make sense? So in other words, if you know the purpose of the communication, um, you can um, actually get at meaning as a di difference between ambiguity and equivocation. For SETI, I'll just throw in SETI. If, uh, if you use the entropy as a classification of complexity, you could, if you ever get a radio signal from space, you'd know right away how complex it is. And if it's up here and we're here and, and squirrel monkeys are there, well, we'll know where we stand. 
So you guys are proving something to SETI. And that is SETI is famous for saying, gosh, are we alone? And you guys are proving, no, we're not alone. There's millions of languages on Earth, or you might say languages. And uh, so I bring back that message to, you know, home. Oh.